Hey guys, so today we are going to be reading The Memory Coat, story by Elvira Woodruff, illustrations by Michael Dooling. So long ago, a young girl named Rachel and her husband Grisha lived with their family in a small town far away in Russia. Such a town was called a chateau. It was where many of the Jewish people lived. There, they worked as cobblers, blacksmiths, tailors, and shopkeepers. Their little wooden houses and shops ran all along the cobblestone streets. The houses were often filled with large and lively families. Rachel and Grisha had such a family, and oh, what a commotion they made. There always seemed to be a baby crying in the cradle, a cousin tapping at the door, an older sister humming at the stove, a younger sister pleading for something sweet to eat, and always there was Rachel chattering away. And in the midst of this and that, there was their grandmother, Bubba, covering her ears and shushing them. Kibud avem, she would say. But quiet was something Rachel could, ne could never be. For she loved to tell stories, and her cousin Grisha loved to draw pictures to go along with them. From the first morning light to the setting of the sun, Rachel and Grisha's stories continue. They were the best of friends, and they shared all their deepest secrets. It's a big family, I bet. But it had barely been a year ago that Grisha had come to live with Rachel's family. He had been orphaned when he lost his parents in an epidemic. And there were still times when he would run to the alley behind the synagogue where he could be alone to grieve. And those times, at those times, Rachel's mother and grandma worried about Grisha being outdoors in the cold with only his threadbare coat to keep him warm. But whenever they offered to make him a new one, Grisha always refused. I like my coat the way it is, he would tell them sharply, and he'd race out into the icy wind. Then Rachel would throw on her own warm woolen coat and fly out the door to confront him, or to comfort him, not comfort him. Grisha always found great comfort in their storytelling game, and once they began, the game could last for hours. One day, Rachel pointed to out a mouse that had run under a wagon. Such a long tail, Grisha sighed. Yes, he's very fine, Rachel agreed. And look, he's come from the Tsar's palace with a, mes with a message. Rachel's voice grew low and shivery with excitement. And as she went on to tell the story of this enchanted mouse, go ahead, Grisha, draw it just as I say. With his mittened fingers curled around a frosted twig, Grisha scratched a dazzling castle in the snow. It, in its turret, he drew a mouse with a miniature sword in his paw and tiny smile with, on his whiskered face. And so the two spent many a frosty afternoon in an alley behind the synagogue with Rachel weaving her words for Grisha's swirling figures in the snow. Meanwhile, from within the temple, their grandfather's chanted prayers were as comforting as a lullaby. Life was simple and bittersweet, and it seemed times would never end. It looks cold there. Then one day, the news spread through the market that the Cossacks were coming on powerful horses and waving sharp swords. They were looking to kill anyone who was Jewish. There was great chaos as babies cried, dogs barked, and wagons clattered over cobblestone. People screamed and shouted and ran to hide in their cellars and attics and barns. 
From their attic window, Rachel and Grisha trembled as the Cossacks swept through their town. Russia is no longer a safe place for us to live, their grandfather whispered late that night. As the frightened family gathered together, we must not wait for our children's blood to color the snow. Rachel's father added, we must go to America. In America, they will be safe. So the family set about making plans to leave. They sold most of what they owned to buy their tickets and say goodbye as one by one, friends and neighbors packed and left. In the days that followed, Rachel's family wondered and worried about the journey they were about to make. They had heard stories about the long, hard ocean voyage and the dangers along the way. But the tales that frightened them the most were those immigrants who had given up so much and traveled so far only to be turned away at a place called Ellis Island an inspection station in New York's harbor. There, immigrants were inspected to be sure they were healthy and had enough money and could take care of themselves. We must make a good impression so that we'll be allowed to stay in America, their grandfather told them. As the family gathered round the table for the last time, if we make one mistake, we could be separated forever. Everyone shuddered at the thought. There will be no mistakes, Rachel's father said. Then we'll have to do something about Grisha's coat, Bubba decided. Look how torn and tattered it's become. If we're to make a good impression, he will have to have a new one. Come, Grisha, let me measure your arms. No, Grisha cried. He grabbed the coat and ran to the attic to hide his aunts and uncles clucked and shook their heads. What can he see in such an old coat? He sees the inside, Rachel whispered. It's lined with the beautiful wool from his very own mother's coat. Inside, he can feel his mama's touch. Ah, their grandfather's sad sigh filled the room as a fierce wind whistled around the windows. Everyone lowered their eyes, ashamed at having forgotten how Grisha's dear mother had struggled to make him the little coat in the last winter of her life. Not another word was spoken about it and Bubba took out her basket to mend the coat once more. Early the next morning, the family packed their few belongings and said goodbye to the only place they had ever called home. Together, they made the difficult journey first by wagon, then by train, and finally by the big ship that crossed the ocean to America. The rough ocean voyage took 14 days. To comfort themselves, Rachel and Grisha played their story game. By the time they reached New York's harbor, they had left a trail of their stories and drawings stretching all the way back to Russia. And so it was that that and so it was that this family made its way to a long line of people to the place called Ellis Island. And so it was that Grisha's tattered coat made it all the way with them. <clears throat> Grisha and Rachel held tight to their grandmother's skirts as they were swe swept along in the crowd. As the din of thousands of stranger, strange voices echoed through the large hall, they couldn't help wondering and worrying about the inspectors who watched them. Would they pass the inspections? Would they sent back, be sent back to Russia? Would the family be separated forever? It's a lot of people and they, that, that really did happen in Ellis Island. They waited in a line, then another, then another. To still their fears, Rachel and Grisha continued their game. Once there lived a magical bird with golden feathers, Rachel began. Grisha took out a pencil and a piece of paper he'd found and leaned on a plaster pillar as he drew. As he, she told her story, Rachel spread her arms and pretended to fly, but she suddenly lost her balance and fell against Grisha. The two tumbled 
down and knocked over Bubba's basket beside them. Rachel was unhurt, but Grisha scratched his eye on the basket's lid. Uh-oh. Now he's got a, look at that scratch going down his eye. By the time his turn came to be examined, Grisha's injured eye looked quite red and irritated. When the doctor lifted Grisha's eyelid with the button hook, Grisha cried out in pain. Taking a quick look, <clears throat> the doctor marked a large letter E in chalk on the back of Grisha's coat. Rachel felt her Bubba's hand tightening around her own as everyone began to talk at once. Something was wrong. Something was happening to Grisha. He hadn't passed the inspection. He was going to be sent back to Russia. His eye is healthy. It was just a scratch, Rachel's father pleaded to the inspector, but the interpreter had stepped away. The doctor could not understand Russian or Yiddish, and Rachel's father could not speak a word of English. So the doctor just shook his head, and the chalk E remained. The children were sent to sit on a bench and wait. Why won't they let Grisha stay? Rachel's younger sister asked. Maybe it's his raggedy old coat, said another sister. You should have listened to Bubba and let her make you a new one. I won't let them send you back, Rachel whispered to Grisha. Look at that, how they used to open their eye. Suddenly, Rachel had an idea. Quickly, she pulled off Grisha's coat and turned it inside out, exposing the beautiful wool from his mother's coat. Now, the dreaded chalk mark was hidden from view, and Rachel's father was able to walk Grisha over to another line where he was examined once more. The doctor was kinder and more patient, and he understood Yiddish. He took a closer look at Grisha's eye and saw it was only a scratch. So he kept the chalk in his pocket, and Grisha passed through the rest of the through with the rest of the family, such as one. Rachel's father cried as he lifted Rachel and kissed her cheeks. Everyone was laughing and crying at once. Bubba hugged Rachel and Grisha tight. You were right, Grisha, Bubba said. This coat of yours is very special. Your mama's touch will be with you for a very long time. Not only here on the outside, but here, she said, tapping Grisha's chest on the inside, the most important place of all. So now, so many winters later, the cousins' whispered stories can be heard no more. But in the in a land far from the icy Russian winds, Grisha's tattered coat had been passed down to his children and to his grandchildren. And here it remains to tell a bigger story, for in that worn bit of wool held together by caring stitches are the memories of a mother's love and of a family's journey made so long ago. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed the story.